Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once famously said that the duty to keep a contract at common law means a prediction that you must pay damages if you do not keep it and nothing else. Imagine you sign a contract stating that you will perform renovations at another person's apartment in return for $500 payment, upfront and $3,000 total. Holmes's quote suggests that you have not so much promised that you will do the renovations, but only that you promise to perform or pay damages if you do not do them. The distinction may initially seem unclear or even only a matter of semantics, but today we're going to discuss promissory fraud, a doctrine that demonstrates just how important this distinction is. And by the way, I have a small obsession with promissory fraud, and Greg Class and I have written an entire book called Insincere Promises. And so if you want to learn more about it, you can always uh, look up that book. So a claim of promissory fraud is simply a claim that when a promiser made a promise, the promiser did not intend to keep that promise. If a party proves such a claim, a court can impose punitive damages on the promiser. As a reminder, punitive damages are damages awarded to punish a party's behavior and not to compensate the breached party for the losses the, that the breach causes. The goal of punitive damages is to deter uh, the certain behavior. The award of punies are exceedingly rare in contractual cases, but promissory fraud is one of the places where you might win them. Taking up again our renovation contract example, if you promised to do the renovations because you needed the $500 upfront payment but had no intention of actually performing the renovations, you could end up paying not just expectation damages for the buyer's value of the contract, but also damages punishing you specifically for misrepresenting your intent to fulfill your promise. Some people have trouble seeing promissory insincerity as even a kind of misrepresentation. But to paraphrase a famous English case, a person's intention is as much a fact as what he or she had for breakfast that morning. And hence, intention might be expressly or implicitly misrepresented. Both the restatement of torts and the restatement of contracts contain provisions on promissory fraud. The tort restatement provides that a representation of the maker's own intention to do or not do a particular thing is fraudulent if he does not have that intention. Comment C to this provision explains its application to misrepresentation of intent to perform an agreement. Quote, since a promise necessarily carries with it the implied assertion of an intention to perform it, it follows that a promise made without such an intention is fraudulent and actionable. The restatement of contracts uses language that initially seems not quite as decisive. Section 171, subparagraph 2 provides that if it is reasonable to do so, the promisee may properly interpret a promise as an assertion that the promisor intends to perform the promise. But comment B brings the provision closer to the categorical tort provision, clarifying, quote, it is ordinarily reasonable for the promisee to infer from the making of a promise that the promisor intends to perform it. If therefore the promise is made with the intention of not performing it, this implied assertion is false and a misrepresentation. Unsurprisingly, the primary difficulty in any promissory fraud case is proving the promisor's intent at the time the promise was made. Both the restatement of torts and contracts make clear that the mere fact of non-performance is not itself sufficient to prove the promisor never intended to perform his promise. The breaching promisor might have simply changed her mind, that is, changed her intent after promising. The tort restatement adds as well that the promisor's non-performance doesn't place on the promisor the burden of showing that he failed to carry out his promise for reasons that didn't arise until after the parties entered into an agreement. 
It's the promisee that retains the burden in a promissory fraud claim of actually proving that the promisor did not intend to perform. So what kinds of evidence might a party use to show that the promisor misrepresented his or her intent and never intended to actually perform her promise? A pattern of repeated breaching promises over and over again over time can be powerful circumstantial evidence that a promisor never intended to carry out his promises. Think of the musical, The Music Man. Uh, the plot centers on a so-called professor, Harold Hill, who pretends in community after community to be a band organizer and repeatedly sells town members band instruments and uniforms by promising that he will teach their children to be musicians, and then he skips town. The fact that Hill makes the same promise over and over and never performs compellingly suggests that he never intended to fulfill his promises at the time of promising. In fact, under Illinois law, plaintiffs must prove such a pattern, called a scheme to defraud, in order to prove a promissory fraud claim. As Judge Richard Posner has explained, by requiring that the plaintiff show a pattern, by thus not letting him rest on proving a single false promise, promise the law reduces the likelihood of a spurious suit, for a series of unfulfilled promises is better, though of course not conclusive, evidence of fraud than a single unfulfilled promise. But evidence of such a scheme isn't necessary in other jurisdictions, and factors beyond a pattern of false promises of, of a series of breaches uh, can also be probative of promissory fraud. Perhaps the most commonly raised type of evidence is lack of change circumstance. A promisor who fails to perform and who is accused of misrepresentation usually will argue that he or she fully intended to carry out the promise when making it, but that events or circumstances subsequently arose which caused him or her to change his or her mind. Uh, it's especially probative that there is a lack of changed circumstances when the time period between the making of a promise and the breaching of it is short, because this lack of time suggests that the promiser misrepresented his or her intention. If you rent a car promising to return it in a week and immediately after driving it off the rental lot go sell it to someone else, courts are likely to infer that you never intended to return it. Courts will also consider whether it would have been possible for the promisor to perform his or her promise at the time the promise was made. Consider the Music Man example again. Assume Harold Hill did not know how to play a musical instrument. He couldn't possibly have taught the children of those to whom he sold instruments how to play those instruments. This would be good evidence of promissory fraud because of the, uh, the promiser knew that at the time of promising that uh, his performance would be impossible. Finally, courts may look at internal documents from the promisor indicating that the promisor had no intent to perform. Emails showing the promisor had plans to be in a different location at the time of performance, uh, uh, for instance, would fall into this category. Finally, it's important for us to recognize how promissory fraud law can be and has been subject to misuse. A labor law uh, in the Jim Crow South provides an egregiously clear example. Uh, the, uh, this law, which uh, was on the books in Alabama in the first decade of the 20th century, made it a crime for any employee uh, with an intent to defraud his employer, to enter into an, a, a contract, obtain money from the employer for the promised act or services, and then fail to perform the promise. Further, the statute made an employee's failure to perform prima facie evidence of the employee's intent to defraud. The statute was enforced almost exclusively against African Americans. And this statute was challenged in Bailey versus Alabama. 
And in a 1911 opinion authored by Justice Charles Evans Hughes, the Supreme Court found that it violated the 13th Amendment. Ironically, Justice Holmes dissented, arguing that, quote, a false representation expressed or implied at the time of making a contract of labor that one intends to perform it and thereby obtaining an advance may be declared a case of fraudulently obtaining money as well as any other, that if made a crime, it may be punished like any other crime. Holmes's scholarly theory that a contractual promise is nothing more than a duty to perform or pay damages might suggest a limited ambit for promissory fraud because a promiser might argue that her promise merely implied that she intended to perform or pay damages. But Justice Holmes, in what many believe to be one of his weakest dissents, was willing to countenance Alabama's attempt to use promissory fraud to shore up a system of Jim Crow labor restrictions targeting African Americans. So, what have we learned? We have learned that usually when you make a promise, you impliedly have asserted an intention to perform that promise. As a result, when a party can prove that you never actually intended to carry out what you promised, that party may recover punitive damages, not just whatever amount that party is entitled to by virtue of your contractual breach, but an amount that punishes you for the misrepresentation and attempts to deter you from making such misrepresentations in the future. We also talked about what kinds of evidence might serve to prove that you had no intention of keeping your promise. A pattern or scheme to defraud, the lack of changed circumstances, impossibility of performance or ancillary private documents. Finally, we discussed Bailey versus Alabama in which a statute improperly presumed promissory fraud from any employee's breach, at least when the employee was African American.